Hi everyone. I'm going to force realignment with the section, so I'm going to just do a little mini recap of what we saw today in lecture um, with a little bit more on the Doppler effect so that we both sections can start in the same place after the break. So just to recap, um, I think I will just, I derived one of the equations for standing waves for musical instruments and, thus, and left you to look at the book for one of the other cases, but I think I'll just drive them both here uh, since I have more time here with a video recording. So we looked at standing waves at the beginning of lecture where we were looking particularly for musical instruments where there are fundamental harmonics that get set up. These are standing waves that get set up between two endpoints in a musical instrument, be it two solid endpoints, like where a guitar string is anchored down to, or a violin string is anchored down to the instrument itself. Or they could be open boundaries, like say a, something like a wind instrument, um, a trumpet, or have some combination of, of fixed and open boundaries, like say an organ pipe. So in the case of a guitar, or a violin or a stringed instrument, this was an example of a closed closed boundary where the harmonics that are possible must require that the endpoints, if you have a string that is some length L, say, or a distance of length L that you want to attach a string between two points, those two points must um, be nodes. They must be, if you set up a standing wave, those nodes cannot move. So we saw that one example was the fundamental frequency was an example of a standing wave that was equal to exactly half a wavelength. And then an example of the first, or this would be the fundamental node or, or the fundamental harmonic or the first harmonic. And then another example of one is a case where you get a full wavelength and that oscillates as a standing wave. Or another example might be something that looks a bit like this. And the standing wave just oscillates back and forth and it looks like in that case it is uh, three halves of a, of a wavelength because I got a whole, I got a full wave here um, and then I got half a wavelength there. And so we wrote down that the possible, if we are constrained, that the wavelength must be some, must in some way connect to the length L of the string. We saw that for the fundamental node, sorry, I keep saying no, for the fundamental uh, harmonic, that was when we saw half the wavelength between node to node. The length of the string, the length of the chamber was equal to half the wavelength. And then the second harmonic was a full wavelength. And the third harmonic was three halves of a wavelength. And so in general, we can say that um, it is some integer n times lambda over two. Uh, da -da. And then what we saw to get the formula is we made the connection that given some wave speed v, there is a relationship between the wavelength and the frequency of the wave. So we could use this to say that the wavelength is equal to the wave speed on the medium divided by the frequency. So then if L equals 2 lambda n lambda over 2 that is the same thing as n over 2 times the wave speed divided by the frequency. I'll write f sub n, you know, the frequency for a given harmonic where n can equal 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. And then just solving for the frequency, we see that it's just n over 2 times the wave speed over L. And this is the case for closed closed systems. And I'll just note, because I think I was sometimes calling this V the sound speed, and that doesn't always have to be the case. Like for in the case of a string, um, like on a violin or a guitar, this would be the, the, the wave speed of the plucked string. 
and that vibrating string then causes perturbations in the air, which causes then sound waves to move through the air. But really what we're talking about here is the velocity of the wave on the oscillating medium, which in the case of a stringed instrument would be the string itself. On a, on a drum, this would be the wave speed of the membrane on the top of the drum or the timpani, for example. But if it was, say, a wind instrument where you're causing vibrations in a column of air, like an organ, then that wave speed would indeed be the velocity of sound. And all of them ultimately will excite oscillations that will cause a sound wave to move through the air. Um, but just to be super specific, this V here is the wave speed on the oscillating medium, which for stringed instruments and drums, for example, is not identical to the sound speed. All right, and then we looked at the example of an open-open system. A trumpet would be an example of this. And there I argued that with open-open systems, each endpoint must be an anti-node. So the fundamental harmonic might look something like this. Then it oscillates. If it creates a standing wave, it would oscillate and look something like that. Um, the second harmonic... Might look something like that. So when it oscillates, it looks like that. And then, let's see, and then in the case of it's not quite as symmetric as I would have liked, but you get the idea. You know, another example of a higher level harmonic that can exist as a standing wave in an open open system. And what I didn't really explain, which I don't think your book explains as well, which is kind of interesting, is that you could ask why does it have to be an anti-node uh, at, the, at the edges? Why does it have to be the case where it oscillates up and down versus in the case of a string instrument where we were forced? You know, we had a good argument of why it had to be a node at the end point where it wasn't allowed to move because it was anchored to the wall. You could ask, well, why does it have to be an anti-node at the end? Why couldn't it say, why couldn't I have a standing wave that say looked like this um, and oscillated back and forth or something that looked like this and oscillated back and forth in the case of an open, open system. And the reason is, is because if that were the case, no sound would ever leave the instrument. You know, if you think of one of the interfaces, like what I've drawn here, if you think of that as the interface between, say, the end of the trumpet horn and the rest of the world, in order for people to hear the trumpet, whatever oscillations goes on inside the instrument have to somehow be able to make their way out as a sound wave. They have to be able to perturb the sound that allows that then allows that sound wave to travel into the air and then eventually into someone's ears. But if it were the case where it was a node, right, you know, at the point where um, the trumpet, the inside of the trumpet made contact with the outside world, you know, this interface right here, if it were a node, then you can see that a node for a standing wave, that never moves. So the air that is at the interface right between the inside of the trumpet and the outside of the trumpet, that air, col that, that air column between, between the trumpet and the world would never actually be oscillating with a standing wave. And so as a result, the sound waves would not be able to actually penetrate outward into the world. And so you need an open, an open boundary so that these oscillations that I'm drawing as a transverse wave... Um, actually can make it out into the real world. Because again, remember that for sound waves, sound waves was an example of a longitudinal wave. I've been drawing these transverse waves because I think they're much easier to uh, visualize. I remember in the case of sound waves, it's really just there are densities and low densities that oscillate back and forth. And so you need the interface to oscillate between, you need these waves to actually make it uh, to the edge and make it out into the world. Um, versus if it was just at a node, that interface would always be stationary and you would get little to no sound that makes it out. So just as a quick, just as a quick aside of why that had to be the case.
And in this case, we could write down that L in this case also must be, you can notice that again, we have cases where it's half a wavelength, a wavelength, one and a half wavelengths, etc. And so, yet again, the harmonics are This is for an open, open system. They are, again, the same formula we got for the closed, closed system, where n equals 1, 2, 3, etc. And I don't think I wrote that here, but same thing here. n equals 1, 2, 3. And it's just some integer. And what I did not go through um, is the case of like an organ pipe, where you have one end that is open and one end that is closed. So in this case, you are not... Uh, it's a little bit different because you need this end to be um, a node where then you need this end on the on the other side to be an anti-node. So the longest possible wavelength that can do that or the fundamental node is the case where the length L is equal to a quarter of the wavelength. Another example uh, of this would be one that comes up comes back down and goes out, so it's three-fourths of the wavelength. So in that case, then it would oscillate kind of like this. Then another one, for example, might be uh, something like that, um, which is about five-fourths of the wavelength. So in all of these cases, there is a node at this end, but then there's anti-node at this end. And so what we wrote down in those cases is we said L could either be equal to, um, L could be equal to, we saw the fundamental harmonic was lambda over four. Then the next one we drew in the yellow uh, was three lambda over four. The one we do in the green is five lambda over four, and you see where we're going. So in this case, L in general is n lambda over four, but in this case, n must be odd. So it's one, three, five, seven, etc. So again, using the relationship that lambda equals the wave speed divided by the frequency, we can then rearrange this to get for the case of a closed open system, you get a slightly different formula. Where it is n times the wave speed over 4L. Um, and n is restricted to an odd number, either 1, 3, 5. So for example, there is no second harmonic for open closed systems. You can only have the first harmonic or the fundamental. You can have the third harmonic, the fifth harmonic, et cetera. Um, and we saw in class that that results in different instruments are allowed to, are capable of then sounding different even if they're playing the same fundamental node, that's a fundamental note. Um, but the harmonics that are played on top of it allow for a varied richness, which allows a flute to sound like a flute and not sound the same as a violin, even if they are playing, say, the same note. So sometimes these are all written in the case of, um, in the case of a closed-closed or an open-open system. Sometimes you will see this written as the nth harm, the, the frequency of the nth harmonic, which we said was n times the wave speed divided by 2L. This notice is just the frequency when n equals to unity. So sometimes this is just written as n times the fundamental note or the fundamental frequency. And then similarly for uh, closed open systems, I could write that the, the frequency of the nth harmonic is just n v over 4l, but this is just the frequency of the fundamental note. Uh, so I could write this as just n f1 as well. 
But of course, what I, you know, how this frequency relates to things like the wave speed and the length of the chamber or the length of the string or the length or the length of the membrane or whatever it is, uh, depends on whether it's a closed open system or an open open system, which would be given to you. Uh, so you don't have to memorize properties of instruments. So I would not worry about that. All right, let me now run through an example or two. Suppose I say that a trumpet plays a note 440 hertz. And I could ask, what are the second and third harmonics? So in this case, I would say, well, it's telling you that the fundamental frequency or the first harmonic is 440 hertz. A trumpet um, is a, an example of an open-open system. So I know the relationship between the nth harmonic frequency is just uh, n divided by 2L or n times the fundamental frequency, where n can be 1, 2, 3, etc. So in that case, I would say the second harmonic is just 2 times the fundamental. So in that case, that is just 880 hertz. And the third harmonic is 3 times the fundamental. So that's 320 hertz. So in the case of music, actually, this is an octave higher, and this is uh, somewhere between one and two octaves higher. Because an octave in music, it, it, the frequency doubles for every octave. So going to 440 to 880 uh, is one octave, but then doubling 880 would be another octave, but 320 is not quite double 880. if you were curious. And then if I were asked the same question about an organ, I would say if the fundamental uh, frequency is still 440, um, I would be able to say something about the third harmonic, but I would not be able to say anything about the second harmonic because an organ is an open closed system. There are There is no second harmonic for those sorts of systems. Uh, another example. Suppose you're designing an organ. How long do you need to make an organ pipe so that the fundamental frequency for that pipe is 48 hertz? And here you can use that the speed of sound is the speed of sound I usually write as C uh, sub S is 343 meters per second with on average with normal normal temperatures. All right, so an organ, I know the relationship between the frequency for a given harmonic is equal to n, the wave speed divided by 4L, where n in this case must be an odd number. But I want F1 to be equal to 48 hertz. So I know that F1 is then equal to n equals 1, V in this case, since what is oscillating is the air inside the pipe itself, so the wave speed is just the air speed, the speed of sound in the air. Um, so that's 1 times the sound speed divided by 4L. And again, and I know this, I know this, I can now solve for the length that the organ pipe needs to be. So in this case, L is just CS divided by 4 times the fundamental frequency. 
And then if I plug it in, I get something like 1.79 meters. Uh, so one of the, you know, a longer pipe um, for one of these lower frequency, uh, more deeper sounding notes. All right, pretty straightforward in that case. All right, now for some, this will be new. Well, for everyone, parts of this will be new. Um, but section two, we did not quite get to the Doppler effect. So I'll, I'll re-show these movies in class, but for the Doppler effect, it's that waves, when there is relative motion between the source of the waves and the detector of the waves, um, if there is relative motion between the source and the detector, the wave that you perceive, be it either the wavelength of light, in the case of a light wave, or the frequency of sound, in the case of a sound wave, they will be different than the original sound or light that was emitted. And for clarity, I'm just going to always assume sound from here on out. But again, wave phenomenon, this is a general thing. This would be also true for any kind of wave, including light waves, water waves, waves on a slinky, etc. But going back on our intuition and kind of what we've experienced before, you have all likely experienced or heard the Doppler effect with sound when a a police car or an ambulance with a siren going whizzes past you, the sound that the siren makes sounds different when it is coming towards you versus when the siren is coming away, moving away from you. And, I'm not, and I don't mean this in terms of how loud the siren sounds. That's something else. That's the intensity of sound, which that indeed is a function of how close the object is to you. What I mean is that the actual frequency, or how, fre how is the eardrum in your ear, how many times is it oscillating per second, it is oscillating at a different rate. You hear a different pitch, depending on whether the object is moving towards you or whether it's moving away from you. And similarly, if, you ha if there was someone with an a air horn that was just standing still, if you were running towards or away from that air horn, you would hear different pitches compared to the person who is standing still relative to the air horn. So let me start with the simplest case where nothing is moving. So we have our giant, a giant ear. This will be our detector. And then this will be our source. You know, in this case, a horn or something like that. Now the horn if it's emitting sound, it's emitting a wave that is oscillating, which has a certain wavelength, wave speed, period, etc., all the properties of waves that we've talked about already. And so it is emitting a wave that is traveling from one location to the other. And so when I draw these waves um, like this, think of this as I am drawing the crests of, of every wave. So if you, if you imagine a side view of a transverse wave, what am I what I am drawing when I draw when I draw these lines here is that I'm drawing the locations of the crests of a wave as the entire wave moves in one particular direction. And in this case here, um, it might it would be the case where the wave is moving you know, towards the detector at some speed. In the case of sound, it would just be at the speed of sound. So again, when I, draw the, when I draw these lines to represent the sound wave that is traveling from the source to the detector, think of these uh, curves as where, I'm, as where the crests are being drawn. So the distance in between any two of them is equivalent to the wavelength. You know, things you could ask, and this will be related to the homework, though this is stuff we did really in chapter two. Um, but just are now doing a sound. If the horn and the detector are a length D away, um, you could ask how long does it take for sound to reach one point to the other? How long does it take for a sound wave to go from the source to the detector? Um, but that's fairly straightforward since spe the speed of sound is a constant. I, get a, I have some velocity, which is equal to the speed of sound, 
I have some distance that needs to be traveled, which I just wrote down here as D. And so in this case, you know that and the speed of sound is not changing, so the acceleration of sound uh, is zero. In that case, then x just equals x naught plus v naught times t, because this v here is constant. Or in the case here, the time it takes to go a distance d is equal to the sound speed times some amount of time. Fairly straightforward. Just distance equals velocity times time in this case. Uh, since velocity is a constant, it's a fairly simple equation. It's actually an exact equation, not just an approximation. All right, but besides that aside, if the source emits one wavelength every period, so the period is defined as the amount of time it takes for a given location to start, you know, for the oscillation at a given point in space to start repeating itself. So if the source of the sound in this case is emitting a crest or one of these lines, you know, every, you know, it, it emits one of those crests every time it, the wave completes one period of time. So every period, capital T, one wavelength's worth of sound has been emitted from, from the source. Um, so you can define that, you can define, we'll call F naught, or just one over T, or in the case of sound, the speed of sound divided by the wavelength of the sound. This is, we'll think of this as the original frequency of the sound wave, or the light wave, or whatever wave. And we'll see that when there is relative motion, what you perceive, what actually, what actually your eardrum is doing in the case of sound waves, um, it will oscillate at a frequency that is different than this uh, F naught. So you will perceive a different pitch in the case of sound, or you will see a different kind of light in terms of a light wave. Um, but let's start simple first. Let's start with the example. Let's start with the case of no relative motion. So neither the source nor the detector is moving. The only thing that's moving in this case is the sound that is traveling through the medium from the source to the detector. And we know that it is traveling at a speed equal to the speed of sound C sub s. So we could ask, when there's no relative motion, what frequency do you detect? And it might seem obvious that in this case, you should just detect the original frequency that is coming out of the source. If it is creating you know, a sound at a particular frequency, you should hopefully hear it at that frequency. And that's indeed going to be the case, but we, should, but we can write down how we might calculate that, and then that's going to be helpful when we do it with relative motion. So I will, I will write this down as the frequency you hear. So the frequency you hear, again, is you perceive sound by your eardrum oscillating at a certain, at a certain frequency. And an oscillating sound wave that enters your ear causes your eardrum to oscillate at a particular frequency. So it depends on how many sound waves or how many full wavelengths of, of of sound are hitting your eardrum in a given amount of time. Um, if, if, you know, in the span of, say, two seconds, multiple wavelengths worth of sound hit your eardrum, that will cause your eardrum to oscillate much more than, say, if only half a, a wavelength of sound hit your eardrum. Then it would, your eardrum would have only gone through half an oscillation versus multiple oscillations. So we can define the frequency that you hear will be the number of waves that reach you divided by the time elapsed. So how many waves hit your ear in a given amount of time? That will give you a frequency.
And in the case where everything is stationary, if you just look at the source and detector, if they are both just stationary, then every period, capital T, there is a wavelength worth of sound that it's emitted from the source. They travel, um, those crests then that reach the, that are heading towards the detector are equidistant from each other. They're separated by a distance that's equal to the wavelength. And so therefore the number of waves that reach you um, is just going to be, in a given amount of time, it's going to be CS times the amount of time that passes divided by the wavelength. So this is the total amount of, you know, the total distance of, you know, you can think of the total number of waves that got emitted from the source in a given amount of time that has been able to travel um, uh, to you. And then that is divided by the amount of time that has elapsed. And so in this case, you just get CS divided by the wavelength, the T's cancel, but CS divided by the wavelength, notice on the lower left, is just the original frequency. So in the case where nothing is moving relative to, it, to each other, you, pr you hear the same frequency that's being emitted by the source. All right, let's see, do I wanna do this on the same page? Uh, maybe I'll do one of these on, on the page. Let's do the case of now a moving source. So I think this is what we did in section one, but we did not make it beyond this. So in this case, you have a detector, which I, again, we will just draw as an ear, that is staying perfectly still. So I, I might even say V detector equals zero. But then we have a source, you know, some horn that is moving with some velocity V and it is emitting waves that they themselves are traveling at some speed equal to the speed of the speed of sound C sub S. And there we have to consider the case when the source is moving towards the detector in the case when the source is moving away from the detector, which will in both cases remain stationary to the right of the to the right of the source and the waves will be moving towards the right towards the detector. So in this case, we saw, we looked at some animations uh, where we saw that in the case of, let me actually erase this so it's not confusing. In the case where the detector is moving, or when the source rather is moving towards the detector, it appeared like the waves appeared bunched up in front of the detector relative to behind the detector where they appeared a little bit more spread out. Let me actually redraw this. Um, so in the case of a horn, we saw that the waves appeared kind of bunched up in the front and a little bit more spread out in the back when the source was moving to the right and then the sound speed you know, moves out you know, at some speed away from the source itself. And here's our, here's our ear, which again, the detector is not moving. So again, we could ask ourselves, and why is this the case? Uh, it might be easier to see if we just do two crests. So if I only look for the certain, for an amount of time equal to roughly one period worth of time. So the horn, or in this case, whatever is emitting the source of, of sound, emits a pulse or emits a crest every capital T, every period worth of, you know, for a given oscillation. So if the horn starts at a given location, you know, it emits a sound wave that then starts to move out away from the source. But the source itself is moving in that amount of time. So if it moves some amount, it might move some amount of distance equal to this distance here, 
before enough time has passed where then one period's worth of time has passed and it emits yet another pulse of sound. And we could ask, so this might occur at T1 and this might occur at T2, where T2 minus T1 equals the period of the oscillation. So in the case of T1, the pulse gets emitted from this location here and starts to move out radially from that point. You know, it might be at a location here by time, um, by time it gets to T equals T2. In which case, immediately afterward, immediately at that time, another pulse is emitted. And so in this case, there are two crests that have been formed um, and it might make, be a little bit more obvious here where you can see in the case where you're, where the object is moving in the direction towards the detector, this distance here has become much shorter compared to this distance here when the object is moving away, um, where it seems a little bit more spread out, uh, where here it seems much more squished together. So again, if the ear is here, the number of crests that are that's hitting the eardrum every second is going to increase because the crests now are more tightly squished, more tightly compact together and are closer to one another. The perceived wavelength of the sound is not the original uh, lambda value, but it's going to be some lambda prime value, which is going to be smaller than the original wavelength. And we'll see that court in a smaller um, a smaller wavelength corresponds to a higher frequency, so we'll see that this is going to result in a higher pitch in the case when the object is moving towards the detector. So how can we write this down? How can we write down an actual answer? Uh, let me go down here. So in the case, we could, again, write down the frequency that we hear is the number of waves that pass in a given amount of time. But just to keep the math simple, we could think of the case of like what I've just drawn above, where they're the only, let's consider the amount of time that passes in one period's worth of time. So essentially we have enough time for two crests um, to, pass by, uh, to pass by the giant eardrum. So in this case, the number of waves or the perceived wavelength, um, yeah, the perceived wavelength in this case is not is no longer just the speed of sound times the period. It is now the speed of sound minus the velocity of the source. Uh, in this case, times t. So not just the speed of sound times t, but we see that it's the difference in these two, it has shrunk because now this wavelength has become smaller. So this is smaller than C sub s. So overall, this is smaller than the original wavelength that was emitted from the horn or whatever is moving and emitting this light. So in this case, the number of waves uh, that pass in, in the given amount of time would just be uh, Cs times t, uh, and then it's being divided by the wavelength, which is Cs minus v of the source times t. And then it's all divided by the amount of time that's elapsed, which is just t as well. Again, the numerator, um, you can think of, this was kind of the total amount of distance that's been traveled by the waves um, in that given amount of time. Uh, which are move, which the, the waves themselves are just moving at the speed of sound, and then divided by um, how many wavelengths fit into that distance. Um, and that is what passes by your eardrum in a given amount of time, t. We really could have did this for any time. It doesn't have to just be a period, but I think it's a little bit more clear how we get to the answer when you use the period. So in this case, one of the t's cancel. We get something that looks like the speed of sound divided by the speed of sound minus the velocity of the source, all times 1 over t. But the period of, but 1 over the period of sound is just 
the frequency, the original frequency at that. Um, so we ultimately get our final formula here, which is, it's kind of strung across multiple equal signs. So let me write it up here. That the frequency you hear is not just the original frequency that was emitted, but there's some term here, some non-dimensional term, times f naught. And in this case, you can see that the denominator is going to be smaller than the numerator because you're subtracting away the velocity at the source. So as a result, this actually, uh, this frequency is greater than f naught. You hear a higher pitch when the object is moving towards you. All right, so again, this derivation was source moving toward. For the Doppler effect, it's good to think of this in terms of things moving toward one another should increase the pitch, and then we're about to see that things moving away from one another decreases the pitch. You know, for example, you can see how if we were to repeat this entire thing again with the a moving source but the detector being stationary, but now the source is moving away from the object, then in that case the wavelengths have increased. Uh, this wavelength is larger than the original wavelength that was being emitted. They are more spread out because not only are the crests spaced apart by the period, um, times the speed of sound, but also with the fact that the detector is moving farther away, the detector is moving to the right, so as the, these crests move to the left, the spacing in between them gets increased, um, not only by the speed of sound times t, but also by the fact that the source of the sound is also moving away to the right, um, and it covers then a distance, the velocity of the source times t. So in this case, uh, no, I'm just going to have to go to a new screen. So in the case where, um, let's call it, uh, V detector is still zero, V source is moving away from the detector. So in this case, The horn is moving this way, so the waves get bunched up on this side, but now get spread apart on this side. In this case, uh, you get essentially the same answer that the frequency you hear is cs times t, but now instead of cs minus the velocity of the source, it's cs plus the velocity of the source times t. That's all over t. So then, if you go through the derivation again, it's cs, cs plus the velocity of the source times the original frequency. Which in this case, uh, since the denominator is bigger than the numerator, this is less than the original frequency. The pitch goes down when when the source is moving away from a stationary detector. And we could summarize this as when V detector equals zero, the frequency that you hear is cs divided by cs plus or minus the velocity of the source times the original pitch where you use the plus sign when the object is moving away from you and then the minus sign when it is moving towards you and again you can just think as long as you remember that when objects are moving towards one another the pitch should always increase um, you, could just, you could always reason out whether you should use the plus sign or the minus sign rather than memorizing uh, plus away, minus towards. Just think that 
you know when the pitch should be higher versus lower and use the right sign that gives you that answer. All right, so now the last thing we have to do is what about the case when the detector moves and the source is stationary. So this could be the case where there is a horn that is not moving, so it is emitting waves, but now you yourself are uh, moving either towards or away the source of the sound while the sound itself is moving at some some speed equal to the speed of sound and the source itself is not moving. Now, and this sometimes confuses me too, I have to always think about this. You might think that this should be give you essentially the same answer, that it's only maybe the relative velocity that matters between the two. Because you can imagine if the detector is moving towards the source, how is that any different from the source moving towards the detector? You know, by, you know in, by relative motion, aren't these two things identical? And when we did relative motion in terms of measuring velocities between two objects, you had different reference frames. Indeed, it was completely different. Or, sorry, indeed, it was exactly the same as long as the uh, objects were not accelerating. But it turns out that with sound, it actually does give you a different answer depending on whether it's the source that's moving or whether it's the detector that's moving. If you think about this, um, it might make, make a little sense. If we go back up here to the top, notice that when the uh, source was moving, it made the waves either get bunched up or stretched out, depending on whether the we were looking at the waves that were behind the source or in front of the source as the source was moving. Because the source was the thing that was creating these perturbations, it was creating these oscillations that then moved through the air, it was it was changing the wavelength of the sound that then travels through the medium because if it released a crest at every period capital T then whether the object whether the source was moving or not changed exactly where those crests were going to be emitted and we saw in the case of when you know sometimes that meant the crest got bunched together sometimes that meant the crest got pulled apart now in the case where the source is stationary, ignore the, the ear for now, in this case, the distance between, the two, between these guys are always equal to the original wavelength. Since the source itself is not moving, the, the distance between the crests is always equal to the original wavelength of the sound. But now with the, you know, because again, the source created a perturbation or oscillations in the medium, in this case air, that sound is moving through. But now you have a detector that is moving through that medium and is more or less, you can think of it as a snowplow that is kind of sweeping up waves if it's moving you know, towards or away from the source. And now we again can just ask ourselves how many of these crests are passing by the ear or the detector in a given amount of time. So let's do the case like what I've drawn here, where the source is stationary, but the detector is moving towards the source. So you are running, so you know, Kate, if this were an ambulance, you could be running towards the ambulance. How would the sound change in that case? Well, in this case, again, the frequency that you hear is, again, the number of waves that pass by your ear uh, in a given amount of time. We can use a general time now. Um, so in this case, if you weren't moving, then it would just be the speed of sound that determines this. If you weren't moving, then you would have, you know, the total number of, of waves that would pass by your ear would just be the speed of sound times the amount of time that's passed, and then how many wavelengths made up that, that amount of, of, you know, how many wavelengths could fit into that distance. But now if you're moving towards the source, you could think that you're running into the waves and you're, and you're able to sweep up more of those waves 
in the same amount of time. So then you have plus V of the detector times T as well. And then this is all divided by the amount of time that has passed. This allows you, you know, more wavelengths past your ear because of the fact that you are moving towards the source of the waves. So in this case, all the, all the T's cancel, and this is just the speed of sound plus the velocity of the detector divided by the original wavelength. I'll even put some knots to make it crystal clear. The original wavelength that was emitted um, from the source. But that itself is just equal to the speed of sound divided by the original frequency. So in this case, you get an expression that is the speed of sound plus the velocity of the detector divided by the speed of sound. That's all multiplied by the original frequency. So just because it's spread out a little bit, the frequency you hear is CS plus VD over CS, all times the original source. This is when the detector moves toward a stationary source. And notice this is not quite the same formula that we had before. Um, in this case, the velocity of the detector appears in the numerator, where before the velocity of the source appeared in the denominator. Um, and again, Notice that in the case where they are moving towards one another, in this case, the detector is moving towards the source, there's a plus sign in the numerator. This, again, is larger than the original frequency. There is an, a shift upwards in pitch. And then I think I can, it's okay if I just write down the answer in this case. When the detector moves away from, so from the source, and the source itself still remains stationary, the frequency you hear, um, in this case, is the speed of sound minus the velocity of the detector divided by the speed of sound times the original frequency. which in that case, things are moving away. This pitch is, this pitch is lower than the original frequency that was emitted. So again, towards, pitch goes up. Away, pitch goes down. In both, in both that is true whether the source is moving, whether the, whether the detector is moving. Um, but exactly what frequency is observed depends on whether the source is moving or whether the detector is moving. You can get different answers um, in both those cases. So then, last but not least, maybe I'll do it over here. You could ask yourself, what if both the source and the detector are moving. And your book kind of goes through a, a proof of this. You do not have to derive an entirely new equation, but more or less you can then combine the two results that we have here, where we had, we had one expression, you know, in the case of the source moving, we said that the, uh, the frequency you hear is CS divided by CS uh, plus or minus via the source, the original frequency. In the case where the detector was moving, the frequency you hear was CS plus or minus V of the detector divided by the speed of sound times the original frequency. And so you can combine them and when they both are moving, the most general expression is the frequency you hear is CS plus or minus velocity at the detector divided by CS plus or minus velocity at the source 
times the original frequency. If the source is moving, that can change the pitch that you observe. If you are moving, that can change the pitch that you observe. And notice that this formula that I've boxed in green is a generalization of the two we wrote down. For example, if the detector is stationary, V sub D is zero, and then this just becomes this expression. In the case where the source, if the source is stationary, then V sub S is zero, this expression then just becomes this expression. And if both are stationary, it just breaks down, it just becomes that the frequency you hear is equal to the frequency that was emitted. All right, we will start the next class on Monday doing some problems uh, that involve this. But let me do some quick ones right now, since I have the time. So a perhaps I have a whistle on a string. So the whistle is on a string and I'm and I'm spinning it in a circle around my head. And there's someone really far away that is listening. And if I know that the original frequency of the whistle is 540 hertz, the radius of the circle is 0.6 meters. I'm spinning it with an angular frequency of 15 radians per second. I could ask what frequencies does the listener hear? And you could ask, should they hear anything different than 540 at all? And yes, of course they should. Because in the case where the object is here, at this point in the circle, the object is moving towards the listener. So in that case, um, you have the case where the wave is going to be squished relative to the wave that is moving behind it because it is move the source is moving towards the source is moving towards the detector versus in the case where it's up here the source in that case is moving away from the detector. But what makes this simple is in both cases, the detector is not moving. They are just sitting there listening. So in this case, the frequency you hear um, is just CS divided by CS plus or minus the velocity of the source um, times the original frequency, which we were told is 540 hertz. The speed of sound is 343 meters per second in air. The detector is not moving, so V sub D disappeared. And we have the velocity of the source, which, you know, Technically, there's a range of velocities that are that can occur. I've drawn the two extreme cases, but you can imagine at this point, at this point here, you know, the source is moving perpendicular to uh, the listener. There would actually be no Doppler effect. Similar in the case here, the source is moving perpendicular to the direction that the sound must travel to the listener. In that case, there is no Doppler effect. I guess that is a good point in saying this V sub S and this V sub D must be along the direction between the two. The two being the source and the detector. <laughs>
So in the case where the whistle is moving straight up and straight down, it's moving perpendicular to the direction sound has to travel to get to the big ear, um, there would be no perceived Doppler effect. And then when it's at some intermediate spot, like say right here, um, there would be something in between the between nothing and the most extreme answer. But let's focus on the case of the two extreme cases. In this case, the velocity of sound, or sorry, the velocity of the source, um, it's either going to be moving towards or away the listener at some plus or minus, then I know the tangential velocity in this case is just omega times the radius, so it's going to be 0 0.6 meters um, times 15 radians per second, which then this is plus or minus 9 meters per second. So if I plug in for the speed of sound, 343 meters per second, I plug in that the velocity of the source is zero plus or minus nine meters per second. Um, and then the original frequency was 540 hertz. I get that this is either 526 uh, 0.2 hertz or it's 554.6 hertz. But we need to identify which corresponds to what. You know, in the case I've drawn green uh, for when the source is moving towards the detector and red for when the source is moving away from the detector. So again, if I think towards means that the pitch increases, then I would say that this corresponds to the green case of when the whistle is going towards the detector. And this then must be the case where the whistle is moving away from the detector and they would perceive a lower pitch. All right, one more. Suppose I have two submarines. So let's, let's, let's assume they are farther away than what I've drawn them. I have submarine A, which is moving at some velocity V sub A, and I have submarine 2, which is moving towards the other submarine with some velocity V sub B. So they're moving towards one another. V sub A is 50 kilometers per hour. V sub B is 70 kilometers per hour. Underwater, the speed of sound is much larger than it is in air. Um, so in water, it's about 500, 5,470 kilometers per hour. It's a factor of few larger than what it is in air. Um, sub A emits sonar, which is just a sound wave underwater, at a thousand hertz. And the question is what frequency? does sub B detect, that'll be A, and then B that sonar is reflected back what does sub A get back. All right. So part A. So a sound wave is emitted from A um, and moves towards B at the speed of sound. In this case, the speed of sound underwater. Um, and the question is, what frequency will sub B detect? So in this case, the general formula is that the frequency you hear is C sub S plus V of the detector 
Seeds of S plus or minus V of the source multiplied by the original frequency. The original frequency is just a thousand hertz. Um, the speed of sound we know. We know the velocity of the detector and of the source, but we need to know if we need to include, if we need to use plus signs or if we need to use minus signs. So let's look at the numerator first. Sub B moves toward sub A. The velocity vector of sub V is moving in, in the direction towards the location of where sub A is. Even if sub A was also moving to the left, velocity, the velocity B is still making sub B move towards uh, sub A. Similarly, even if the sub A were moving towards the left and sub A was moving faster than sub B, we would still say that sub B is moving towards sub A because it is moving in the direction towards where sub A is. So with, so in this case, I would say the detector moves toward the source. I know when things are moving towards one another, I want the pitch to increase. So that means I'm going to take the plus sign in the numerator. Because that would cause, if that was the only thing moving, it was just the, if it was just the detector that was moving, um, since, the, since, the de, since the detector is moving towards the source, I would take the plus sign in the numerator. Now about the denominator. Sub A moves in this case, also toward sub B, or the source moves toward, oops, moves towards the detector. So in that case, I would say, since again, and again, this is based entirely on the fact that the velocity vector for sub A is pointing in the direction where sub B is located. It has nothing to do with the magnitudes of the vectors. It only matters that the velocity vector for sub A is pointing towards the direction where sub B is located. Since the source, in this case sub A, is moving towards the detector, I want the pitch to increase Toward th again, think pitch increases when things are moving towards. The pitch should increase. The way to get that to, to occur in the denominator is if I take the minus sign in the denominator. Because again, if it was just the source that was moving and the detector was stationary, I would want the pitch to overall increase. And I can do that by making the denominator smaller or taking the minus sign. So in that case, I would say what sub B hears is the speed of sound plus the uh, velocity of the detector, which in this case is sub B, then CS minus the velocity of the source, which is sub A, all times the original frequency of 1000 hertz. This equals about 1.02 times the original frequency, or about 122 hertz. So the pitch of the sonar wave that reaches sub B is 100, or sorry, 1,022 hertz instead of 1,000 hertz. And again, from the point of view of sub B, they think the sound has a frequency of 1,022 hertz. It has no idea that the original sound wave was emitted at 1,000 hertz. It perceives it as 1,022 hertz. This is important because now with B, in the case of you know, the subs, and a wave originally had moved over to sub B, but then that wave gets bounced back towards sub A.
And what gets bounced back towards sub A? In this case, F naught is 100 and, or 1022 hertz. The perceived frequency or the perceived wavelength or whatever, whichever one you prefer to think about uh, of the sound that reached sub B, that is what gets reflected. So what gets reflected back is a uh, sound wave that has a frequency, a original frequency of 1000 and 22 hertz. But the subs themselves are still moving, so we still have to take into account the fact that there is relative motion between sub A and sub B. So now in this case the detector is sub A, and in this case the, the source is sub B, so they've also switched roles. Um, but in terms of the, what we use, so again, we have that the frequency that sub A here is then Cs plus or minus V of the detector, Cs plus or minus V of the source, uh, all times the original frequency, but here now the frequency has changed to be 1022 hertz. And the detector and source have switched roles. Now the detector is sub A, uh, and now the source is sub B. But in this case, I still can use the same answers in terms of the plus and minus signs because the detector and the source, even though they've switched roles, they are still moving towards one another. Um, but in this case, it's the detector is V sub A and the source is V sub B. Again, since they're both moving towards, they both should work in order to increase the... I should choose the plus and the minus that will make the pitch increase. Uh, so, again, this is just 1.02 times F0, or in this case, 1,045 hertz. Now, sub A could actually use this information, since sub A knows it emitted the source at a 1,000 hertz. It could use the fact that it's getting it back at a different uh, frequency. And if it knew how fast it was moving, it could say something about uh, what sub B is doing. Um, that is kind of how sonar is typically used in terms of determining speeds and distances. Um, and your book goes through an example of a moth and a bat, which I would recommend you look at, because in that case, they're both moving to the right. So when the source gets bounced back off the moth, and, and the sound, so the bat sends a sonar thing to the moth, you have to think of what's moving towards and away, but then when the, when the reflection occurs, um, you have to choose you choose different signs when, uh, in the Doppler effect formula that get plugged into the numerator and the denominator because the source and the detector, um, whether they're moving towards or away from one another, has changed once they change roles. All right, uh, hope that helps. And now both sections can start off in the same place on Monday. And we will do some problems together that will give you some practice with this. Again, hope you guys have a good Thanksgiving. Uh, stay safe, and I will see you soon.